Good morning or good afternoon or good evening to wherever you are in the world. Um, this is Nathan Thanke. I'm the Youth Focal Point for the Global North at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, Negotiations. Um, this is the third in a series of webinars organized by Earth and Brackets, which is a youth group based in Bar Harbor, Maine in the US. Um, and today we have with us Lydia Nakpil from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development and also um, on the facilitation team of the global campaign to demand climate justice. Uh, Lydia is a long-time activist, a very, very dedicated activist across many arenas, um, one of which is the, the climate arena which she'll speak to today. Um, I think anyone that, that knows Lydia is, is quite aware of the amount of work, the sheer force that she is, um, and, and the serious sort of dedication to the cause for justice uh, that, that she has. Um, I'm not going to flatter her anymore because she's probably <laughs> looking at me like, what are you doing? Um, so instead I'll just uh, turn it over to her, thank Sergio for organizing this, and also obviously thank Liddy for um, taking time out in, in an extremely busy period to join us uh, live on YouTube and on Google Hangouts to talk a little bit about um, Southern social movements and, and their attitudes and, and demands and perspectives going into the COP21 in Paris um, in a mat only a matter of days, really. So thank you, everybody. Uh, and Lydia, you can talk away. Um, hello, everyone, and good evening. Um, well, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm very new to this kind of format. I'm not used to uh, using Google. type of format. But anyway, I'm very glad to spend this hour with you. Um, even though I can't see you, <laughs> I can see Nathan and others, Sergio earlier. Um, and I'm very happy to share what our thoughts are on the struggle for climate justice, on our common fight for climate justice. Um, as Nathan said, I'm, I've been around a long time. I guess that's code for saying I'm old. <laughs> I've been here for a few decades. I've, I've uh, worked a long time for a lot of issues for uh, climate justice. is one of the more recent issues that I have been involved in only since the last, I think, seven or eight years. Um, I started as a youth activist like you. Um, Back in the 80s, when we were f our country, our people were fighting against the dictator, and all these many years we have been involved in various issues in our struggle to have a better world, a better life for our people, for our families, uh, for our communities, and for the whole of our people. I must say that climate change is, I think, one of the greatest challenges that we are facing, and one of the uh, most challenging uh, issue that I have been, ever been involved in and that's for several reasons. One is, uh, of course, like many issues that affect our people's lives, the, the impacts are profound, um, but in this case we are quite sure that the situation will get far worse than what we are facing today. The seeds and the basis for what it would be like in the next uh, several years are already here and that's uh, a lot of it is because of the sheer reality that the cause of climate change, excessive greenhouse gas emissions, uh, they're not going to go away for a long, long time. No? So we're sure that the situation will get far worse before uh, it can get better before it can stabilize no matter what we do today. So it really is a big challenge for us uh, to make sure that it's not going to be so bad that it will change the entire, all life on earth so profoundly that we will not be able to even imagine what it would be like. Another reason why it's so challenging is because there is only a small window of time for us to act, for us to stop it from getting uh, to be worse. No, in, in the climate language, it's called 
you know, climate chaos or, you know, being past the tipping points or, you know, climate catastrophe is one word we, we use. Um, although I'm not so satisfied with that because when we say climate, we're stopping the situation from we reaching catastrophic uh, proportions. Uh, the reality is for many communities, it has already reached catastrophic proportions, catastrophic levels. But it's it's trying to describe a situation when there's you know the, it's a runaway climate change. You, the scientists will tell you that they cannot even begin to predict what will happen when we reach tipping points. Uh, so we only have a window of time to prevent that. We only have a small window of time to try to make uh, try to stop the temperature rise from uh, reaching. We are getting beyond at the moment what is still possible getting beyond 1.5 degrees centigrade. Um, in fact, when we started campaigning, the, the strongest, the most stringent demand at that time was for us to keep temperature rise from reaching 1 degree centigrade, you know, or to keep it as far below as 1 degree centigrade. But several years later, the scientists are telling us that it's no longer possible. What 1.5 is the most optimistic that we can be, and even that, the chances are already very slim. We really have to work very, very hard. And not only is the window of time very small, it's also decreasing very rapidly. It's very, it's closing very rapidly. So unless we do uh, the best, the most that is possible to do in the next several years, then we're not going to have a chance of keeping it below 1.5 or 2 degrees, and that's that 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 window will close. No? Um, in the last uh, intergovernmental panel on climate change report, no, the IPCC report that was released last year, uh, if you extrapolate from their fi the figures and their projections, um, what we've come to realize is that we only have probably about 12 or 13 years to do what is required um, so that we keep it below 1.5 or below 2 degrees. And if we don't do what we should do within the next 12 to 13 years, that is going to close forever. So what that means is that um, you know the the responsibility for um, solving this problem lies on our generations, the generations who are alive today. And in fact, it also principally relies on relies on you, young people who still have a few decades left, several decades left. Uh, for us. For, for the world to be saved from this from catastrophic climate change. Uh, we can't uh, think that this is a struggle which uh, we can um, bequeath to generations who aren't even born yet today. We need to solve it now or else future generations will not have a chance. Um, then it's also quite challenging because, um, you know, for, for many of us who have been involved in a lot of issues, uh, we know that you know all issues are have global implications all issues are related to the global system but many issues can uh, be addressed in a significant way within our national borders you know? so for instance uh, economic justice uh, building economic structures that will uh, and alternative economic systems that will ensure a much better life for our people. They have national solutions. We can do something within our borders, national borders, to make that possible. But climate change, this is not a problem that can be resolved in a significant way within national borders. It is truly a global uh, problem requiring global solutions because not one country uh, even if it does its utmost, can save its people from facing climate catastrophe. It has, it requires everyone working together, all countries working together. So it, it, this is very challenging in that sense. A fourth reason is that, you know, it's uh, people's nature, I guess, to uh, feel the urgency when they're already facing the consequences and the impacts. Uh, but the challenge of climate change is that the impacts that you are facing today will not cannot be reversed. No? 
it's mostly irreversible. So we're not fighting to go back to a much better period where we where we had a better situation. What we're fighting is to keep ourselves from experiencing far worse consequences. And, and that's quite challenging because by the time people are uh, facing really bad situations, it's too late to, uh, to, to move out from that situation. The only thing you can do is to prevent yourself from facing much worse. So in all these dimensions, it, it's quite challenging. It really um, has um, you know, mobilized a lot of people. Uh, they, they, people are beginning to see the urgency and the challenge to solve this together um, and especially in places like the Philippines which is uh, well they call it we're one of the frontline countries in terms of impacts you know uh, being in the front line in terms of threats in terms of risks in terms of actual impacts uh, one of that of course which, which is already well covered by media is experiencing the impacts in terms of extreme weather events um, the Philippines is very used to having typhoons you know, ever since I can remember and even decades before I was born our country because of its geographical position uh, is visited by more than 20 typhoons on the average a year but only in the last few years has have we ever experienced super typhoons of such proportions that uh, has you know has caused so much havoc and destruction, unprecedented, um, and we experiencing it. We are experiencing it frequently and even more frequently. And the magnitude and the strength of the typhoons are getting stronger. Um, and it's now become, you know, what in the Philippines is called the new normal. No, it's it's not. It we can't pretend, you know, that these are unique situations. You know, just bizarre. Uh, examples of what can be you know unique or rare extreme weather events because it's happening very frequently and that's one of the impacts of climate change one of what or one of the realities of climate change um, but you know the the irony is there's also prediction that our country will um, experience very very severe heat and loss of uh, you know well the certification in many areas so there's this very big irony uh, there's very big comparison and extreme contrast of different types of impacts we will also uh, experience uh, the impacts of sea level rise we are a country of 7104 islands um, well, but that's really small compared to Indonesia, our neighbor of 12,700 12, odd islands. And so they have several thousands more islands than us. So we may not be a small island country, but we are a country of many small islands. And it's no longer a question of whether we will lose these islands, whether they will disappear. It's simply a question of how many, how many thousands of our islands will disappear and when, how soon it will happen. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's really a, you know, a, a very huge issue now in the Philippines. Maybe 10 years ago, probably less than 5,000 people even think about climate change or even know the term probably are familiar with what it is or maybe more than that but certainly not a hundred thousand but now millions of people know what it is because of what we have gone through so it's very important for us to build movements to address this issue and and here I really emphasize that we need big movements huge movements that involve as many people in as many places in as many walks of life that we need especially those who are feeling the impacts the worst because uh, climate change is an issue that's not going to be easy to solve because there's a lot of economic invested interests uh, at stake uh, we know that it is an it is one of the consequences of the type of system that we have a system that is so addicted to fossil fuel a system that is not um, you know the lot its logic is not to provide for people's needs but a system of 
extraction, production, and distribution of, of goods and services mainly for the pursuit of profit, profit. So it's at the expense of people, it's at the expense of the environment, and there's huge things at stake for those who are benefiting from this system. And we know from experience how hard they are working to secure this interest. And if we don't struggle hard and meet this with our own force and our own power and our own strength, then we have no hope of changing the system in order to solve uh, climate change. Uh, we know that it's a question of power. They're much more powerful now. I mean, their their economic resources make them very powerful. The, the economic resources make it possible for them to also uh, accumulate all sorts of different kinds of power, like political power or military power. Um, and we need to be able to, you know, confront this power with our own. And the only and the most reliable power that we have to confront this is the power of people being united and moving and working together. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a reality we cannot escape from. If this problem was a problem that we can primarily solve by the sheer force of uh, force of superior argument, by the sheer force of um, evidence you know, to the, that present its present the, the truth about what climate change is and what is causing it. If it, if it primarily takes mainly well-researched position papers that show that there are, are alternatives, then we would have won a long time ago. You know? But this is, this, all these things are important, but without the sheer power of people behind it no? and expressing this power by action, by people moving and acting together, showing it in terms of mobilizations on the streets, showing it in different forms and venues that express people's opinions and positions on these issues. If we don't do that, then there's no hope. So, so it's very important that we build our movements. Um, we in the South are also saying that it's very important that Southern perspectives are heard on this issue. Uh, when we say North and South, it's not a geographical dis description. No, we use these terms to mean uh, people of the South, meaning those who are um, marginalized, those who are discriminated, people who are impoverished, people who are exploited and abused. So there is a term that says people in the global south, and that means there are also people of the south in northern countries, you know, if, if you get that meaning. So we need to have the perspectives of people who are the first to be uh, affected, people who suffer not just the consequences of climate change, but the other consequences of this system, impoverishment, injustice, uh, discrimination. We need to have not just our perspectives heard, but we need to have a leadership in the process of addressing these issues because we have to make sure that the solutions to this issue will also address all the other problems that this very same system that is causing climate change uh, is bringing to us. No? So when we say solutions to climate change, it, they have to be solutions that also address poverty, that also address the lack of injustice. Not just because these issues are important, but because you cannot also solve climate change unless you also address these very issues. I guess an hour is not enough to explain all the various links, but I just want to make sure that this message is, is something that is shared to you, that the perspectives of people in the South, the perspectives of people that are exploited or oppressed, discriminated, marginalized, uh, we need to take this into account, their experiences, and also make sure that there is a leadership of people uh, who who actually suffer the consequences so that the solutions we de develop and the solutions and the perspectives that we develop in terms of uh, not just an the analysis of why things are the way they are, but also the strategies that will bring us forward are informed by this 
actual uh, experiences of what it means, of what it takes in order for us to, uh, to rise to these challenges. Um, that's why in Paris, it's it's one of the one of the things that we want to be able to do is to bring people who can talk about their experiences, who can share this perspective. So it's very important for us to make sure that maybe in far fewer numbers, because it takes a lot of resources to bring people there, um, which we don't have, but we want to have a strong presence there as well. Um, one of the, I guess, one of the uh, challenges we have seen in the last few years as we participate is uh, how to be able to see uh, that people from the South are not just there to be kind of token uh, exhibits of what it means uh, that how to be able to show that we also have our own uh, perspective and analysis and take on things and that we are all there as equals in order to forge uh, you know our movements together and to forge to blaze our paths together um, so I'm here to answer any questions that you have I guess maybe it's it would be also uh, have a good chance to just maybe tick off some of the really important issues uh, that we want uh, to be addressed in these negotiations. Not that we have a lot of illusion that these negotiations will be able to address all these issues in a way that is satisfactory to us, but uh, to make sure that the governments are um, aware that we, are, we have our demands in terms of how they must uh, fulfill their obligations towards people. So. One of that is to make sure that the agreement, that the discussions, the agreement are, is able to address um, the necessary ambition no? in terms of uh, global actions to, to reduce emissions and to make sure that the global actions are not just ambitious but also equitable and fair. I heard that we, you had a previous speaker, Shivan, who we work with uh, quite closely in order to develop the technical analysis and projections on what emissions reductions mean, but the general uh, demand that we have is that there has to be from all governments, uh, actions that are ambitious enough and that there has to be a fair sharing of these efforts. Um, the fair sharing and, and justice, uh, you know, the justice uh, issue in the sharing of efforts is not just simply because it's a good principle. No, it's also a very practical one. We cannot expect to solve the problem unless those that have contributed the most also contribute the, the most to the solutions. You can't expect uh, countries that have contributed very little emissions to make a huge reduction in emissions if they're not emitting in a huge way in any case no so that it also has its very practical side it's not just because the the principle is good but because the reality is that this kind of approach is required for all of us to succeed um, I I'm not sure if that has been mentioned already in the past but there we have worked out uh, roughly what does it take you know to make sure that we keep um, the rise in temperature below 1.5 degree rise or 2 degree rise and uh, right now uh, what the scientists are telling us is that we need to be almost zero in terms of car uh, greenhouse gas emissions or carbon emissions by the year 2050 almost zero that is a huge thing it is still possible, they're saying, but it requires a lot of political will on the part of governments and requires a lot of changes in our economies in order to make it possible. But that's for all countries. If we want to make it to keeping it below 1.5 to 2 degrees, it also means that we need to have the rich and wealthy countries be near carbon zero by 2030. 
I mean, the literature will tell you it's carbon zero by 2050, carbon zero or full, full decarbonization by 2030 for the rich, wealthy countries. But uh, I say near carbon zero because in actuality, it's not possible to have carbon zero. Um, one of the challenges on this point is that there are other groups working out this position or pushing forward this position of net zero. No? For those of you who will be going to Paris, you're going to hear a lot of the net zero noise. No? Groups saying it has to be net zero. Governments wanting to put net zero in the, in the text. This is very dangerous. No? Whereas, uh, Carbon zero is different from net zero. Net zero means we will continue, they will continue to emit carbon, but they're going to develop technology that will try to suck the carbon out of the air. And that is very dangerous, first of all, because there's no reliable technology that has been event invented yet, or even safe technology to do that, and there's no certainty that they ever will succeed in inventing that. And secondly, because uh, all this talk of net zero is going to make group governments complacent, companies complacent, or it's going to give them an excuse not to aim for radical, actual domestic cuts in their emissions. So that, that's very dangerous. Uh, another whole area that is very important for us is for uh, the delivery of finance because it's very important that Developing countries not only do their share, but also do more than their share because um, the rich countries can no longer do everything within their own countries. They uh, owe the world so much that they cannot pay it off only by their domestic uh, reductions. And I guess Shivan probably covered a lot of this, so I'm not going to talk more about it. I just want to emphasize that this is a major concern for us, so a major demand that we have from Paris, for the governments in Paris is for the, them to uh, act with ambition, with urgency, with fairness, and with justice on this uh, question of uh, emissions. The second is that we need them to address, uh, to deliver finance also so that we can undertake uh, resilience, building our strength in the developing countries uh, because we, well, well in, in the UN they call it adaptation, but you know, it covers many things, uh, but that basically means that because there are a lot of impacts are already there, we can no longer reverse and things are going to get worse. And a lot of changes will, will mean that we need to adjust to these new conditions. And that means adjustment means not just you know, dealing with it so that we avoid certain things, but also adjustment means we need to build our resilience and build our strength in the face of that. Um, you know, it, it covers a lot of things from practical things like how do you deal with frequent super typhoons? What kind of in infrastructures do you have to build? What kind of readiness that you have to train our people for? Or what kind of kind of uh, what kind of adjustment in you know simple things like where they live? They they need to evacuate from very vulnerable and dangerous areas. No, um, there's also things like how do we plant our rice in conditions where there's frequent flooding and huge flooding? Do we have to move? Uh, planting our rice on the slopes of, of mountains as as many of our ancestors did at some point. So there's a lot of changes in agriculture that we have to do so that we can still continue to produce our food. So these types of very concrete things, we need to do that. That requires also finance. And it is enshrined in the convention that the, the countries or the governments, the institutions that are responsible for climate change should pay for the cost of adaptation for people to be able to adjust to this situation, especially the people who were not responsible in the first place. And another area where we have big demands is the question of how do they address the loss and damage issues. And this means all this loss and damage that will inevitably happen, they're already happening, because you can't avoid everything. You can't 
prepare yourself for everything. There's going to be unavoidable loss and damage that will take place. So how are we going to address that? No, it, it, Typhoon Haiyan alone took more than 10,000 lives. It it uh, it resulted in more than two million people losing their homes. Uh, it resulted in several thousands of hectares which we were not able to plant, you know, crops for our food for several for two years now. There, the the land is still healing. No? We lost so many thousands of hectares of coconut trees, which thousands of people are relying on for their livelihoods, and they're not just going to sprout up just like that in two years, three years or even eight years down the road. So these kinds of things, how are we going to address this as a global community? Who's going to help cover the expenses for, for you know, uh, recovering from this uh, heavy damage and destruction? So these are, these are the, the major issues that we have demands about. We, we are demanding that they act with urgency to address this. And th that also means that we, they, that Many things in our own countries have to uh, move quickly, uh, including, for instance, changes in energy systems that we need to do, not just in the north, but also in the south. Uh, and so that's one of the major campaigns that we're doing, which is uh, calling for moving away from dirty energy and making very quick, very fast, as fast as fa possible transition to clean and renewable energy for people and communities. So, you know, I've got I've covered some of it. There's a number of issues that we still need to address. There are issues about the impacts of false solutions like agrofuels. It's one of the issues that's hurting us in the south because, you know, if, especially for instance in Europe because that's a big demand. There's this all this shifting from fossil fuel to uh, what they call biofuels or agrofuels, uh, you know, it's 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 making Europe look good because it, they're saying, you know, this is part of our moving away from fossil fuels. But the there is still such high demand for energy that replacing fossil fuel with agrofuels is also causing massive problems in other places, and that means for us. Uh, diminishing our capacity to produce for our own food because instead of planting uh, f uh, crops for our food, we're planting palm oil and other kinds of uh, biofuels for consumption of energy in Europe that keeps growing. No, it's not. There's no. There's no significant uh, diminishing of consumption of energy in Europe. The shift from fossil fuel to palm oil and agrofuel is just simply creating uh, other problems elsewhere and that means for many places in the south that means food, you know, for our, our own food security. So there's a number of things that uh, we are addressing uh, not just in Paris but in this ongoing process of the global community coming to terms with and discussing what and struggling out what the solutions are for climate change. I guess the last point I want to make before we open this for sharing and discussions is to say that we can't really afford the governments to be doing this on their own. Uh, the governments, many governments, unfortunately, I would say even most governments are there to protect the interests of the elites in their countries, even our governments in the south, surely, uh, so that we need to be there to make, not just to make our voices heard, but to actually intervene in how these negotiations are going on. Um, and also to say, you know, uh, just to be clear that we're in this for the long haul, we're not going to um, solve this in just a year, two years, or three years. So be prepared. Thank you. Thanks, Liddy. Um, let's see on the Q&A if there are any questions coming in. Um, it's sometimes a little bit hard to for people to access via the Google Hangout, so maybe people watching on YouTube uh, want to ask questions via Twitter instead. Um, I, I kind of had a couple of, of things that um, I would invite you to speak a little bit more about, because I think these are from, from a couple of years operating in youth activism around the climate change talks. These are issues that I, I think would be useful for you to, to get your perspectives on. 
Um, but then I can take some questions if, if any are, are arising. Um, well, first of all, I think it's we're, we're not actually very aware, at least I'm speaking from my own uh, personal position, at least when I, when I came into this space, is that I think a lot of young people, because the majority of the young people that are present at these talks, um, and the majority, obviously not all, but the majority of us are youth from a relatively privileged background. Um, it's a space often sort of dominated by, by Global North um, youth, and obviously we're not homogeneous, but uh, globally privileged. Um, and so I think we're sometimes a little bit unawares, and at least initially, of the scale of the challenges uh, faced by Southern groups, especially from people from the grassroots, um, in trying to advocate for their positions at the UN. So if you could speak a little bit more about what are the types of challenges that you've experienced over the years, that will be useful for us, I think. Um, and I think also there's a, a very strong tendency, and you've spoken a little bit to this, but there's a very strong tendency towards um, feeling frustrated with the talks, feeling frustrated legitimately, but we're all frustrated, right? with the lack of progress and, and seeing and, and recognizing the urgency and feeling the urgency but not seeing that um, reflected in the in the negotiations um, in any real way and not seeing concrete results. And so I think as a result of that lots of young people that I know are possibly then prone to just say, well look, I mean, this is pointless, let's completely leave. I mean what's the point in being here? Um, and they go and do very, still very valuable work in uh, other arenas, um, often sort of mobilizing to shut down fossil fuel infrastructure, but then their attitude towards the UN is one of dismissal. So I wonder if, if you can sort of speak a little bit to the why, what, what value do you see in continuing um, to maintain a presence and continuing to struggle for climate justice in the UN um, because I think that's something it's good to get very clear uh, on. Um, so those are two things and maybe while you're talking I'll also try to scan Twitter to see if any questions are coming in from that forum. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll take your second question first before the first and then the, set, the first question next. Um, yeah, I think that first question, why are we still in the UNFCCC space when it's so very frustrating when I can also say after about eight years of participating and intervening in this process we've seen very very little progress and I, I guess the first important thing to note is that what they're discussing, what they're agreeing on or not agreeing on will have a major impact on our lives and if for that reason alone we need to meddle into it, we need to intervene, we need to be present, at the very least find out what it is they're discussing and what are they agreeing on in our behalf. Uh, so I wouldn't advocate that we keep away. I think we would should have a, more effort to try to be very strongly present so that they can't just ignore us but have to deal with what we have to say about the issues that they're discussing. Um, if we weren't there, whatever we have bad seen, the bad things we have seen coming out of the negotiations, it would be far, far worse if we weren't there. You know? So, in a way, one of the first roles or tasks we have to do is to act as sort of like a deterrent to keep things from getting worse, because they they can get much, much worse. I have seen, if if you note, you, you see closely. I have we have seen. What it, what it is, for instance, what the U.S. really wants in the negotiations. In the end, it doesn't get everything that it wants because we're there to stop it. You know, just having one country as an example, one government as an example, and there are many other examples that we can cite, like uh, the proliferation of carbon markets, the type of agreements they want to have on forests, um, you know, now they're pushing for net zero and there's a lot of resistance against it and it will be far worse if they're just allowed to just completely run away with what they want to happen. The second thing is that there are certain victories that can be possible if there are, we are stronger. And by victories, I don't mean complete solutions to climate change, but what I would mean 
is winning certain instruments or certain parts of the agreement that then we can grab, turn around and use uh, so that it makes our campaign stronger or turn uh, and grab and turn around and then use on the ground so that they provide, they, are, they serve as instruments for our local fights uh, to use in order to, you know, gain some strength in our, in our fights against particular issues. So I'm saying that it's an arena that has, uh, you know, potentially many important things that we can win uh, and and by winning, it may look, it may be in terms of stopping something, or it may be in terms of gaining something that we can use, no? that can that can be advantageous to us. Um, the other thing is that these talks are times when the world's attention, or at least the media and a number of institutions' attentions, are turned on the issue of climate. And there's a lot of discussions that go around publicly, that goes out into the public sphere, that affects public understanding and opinion about this issue. And we have to be there to deliver the truth, to deliver our counter messages to a lot of the lies that are being promoted, uh, so that people will have a, a better understanding, a more critical understanding of the issues and not just hear what the governments have to say or what the corporations have to say, which most of the time are just, you know, to just secure their own vested interests. So we have to be there to, to speak truth to power, to tell our stories, to make sure that people have a better grasp of what are the things that are at stake in, this, in these discussions. Um, if we're just going to allow them this arena and not be able to counter this, then the world will be a, a much, much worse situation. Um, so these are not just arenas, they are events which we have to be around in order to, you know, to make sure that there, is, uh, there are other voices that people hear. Um, then the third issue, the third reason is because when we say we want to build movements and gain our strength, we don't, we are not, we cannot build movements and strengthen movements just by, I mean, this is very important, but we don't, we can't build and stre strengthen movements simply by doing educational activities. People have to have the actual experience of fighting, no? of campaigning and fighting and be, being engaged in battles, so to speak. So we're there to do that so that we are also able to, you know, meet other groups and that helps build our movement. So there are many reasons why have, we have to continue being there. It doesn't mean that one day there won't be a, a right moment to say we will walk away. No, there's there are there, they, these can be moments when we decide we will walk away, not just for a day, but for you know for good. I mean, I'm not closing the door on that one. But at the moment where we are, we're accumulating our strength, we're building our strength, we're trying to um, intervene in the in the public discourse, in the mainstream discourse. We want to uh, promote a counter narrative, so we have to be there in in this arena. The second, uh, the first question, which is now the second, what kind of challenges do we face? Ah, many things from practical small things like even getting there, getting to be in these places where these discussions are being held, uh, dealing with foreign languages because they're, the main language is in English. This is not the first language for many of our people. Uh, just having a sense of what's going on. There's thousands of people walking around and, you know, it's, it's, it's like a whole circus multiplied several times over. Um, it's, it's also dealing with all this policy language that's going around. I mean, if you don't carry, I, it takes you quite a number of meetings to even understand half of the acronyms that they have. We should actually publish a, a guide to the language of the UNFCCC. Um, and then also, because you're from the South, you're not white, you're from countries that are considered not important, you're not major economies in the world, people are not going to want to listen to you much. I mean, and even potentially friendly people would overlook you because, you know, 
Um, so there's a, there's a lot of challenges to that. Even among peers, even among civil society groups and movements, it's very difficult because, uh, of course, even among civil society and movements, the, the, these civil society and movements also reflect some of the inequities in the world. No. Um, then the UNFCCC space, you know, we, we've worked also in other UN spaces. This is one of the worst spaces to work as a CSO. There are so many rules and restrictions. You can't even do a lot. There's a lot of things. I mean, if these rules and restrictions existed in our own countries, we would already be, you know, in a huge uprising for it being so authoritarian and undemocratic. It's it's worse than the last few years of the dictatorship in our country where we w we already recovered a lot of democratic rights because we fought for them. And then you come to a space like the UNFCCC and it's like, wow, I couldn't believe the first few years I was there. Every little single thing you have to seek permission for. I mean, Nathan knows a lot about that. So th th that's a huge challenge and es especially a challenge when you know you, you're in you're from countries where uh, they could easily how do you say deport you if you violate the rules or not be able to get back again ever so I mean even to secure visas I mean maybe I should have started with that even to secure visas not least of, uh, even if you had the resources to buy your tickets to secure visas is very very hard so I don't know, Nathan, <laughs> these are the sort of very concrete things or challenges that we, we have. Um, also, you know, we also have to remember that many of the actual leaders who get to these spaces are there not just in behalf of themselves, but also in behalf of thousands of people back home who we represent because they're part of our organization. No? So, you know, you know that your voice is supposed to carry a lot of weight because, you know, you're vested with this responsibility to talk in behalf of and be accountable to thousands of people back home. And then you find, your, your play, your, your, find yourself in a place where, you know, it's, it's very, even very hard to fight for the space and the time to get your positions and your voices heard. You know, so that's... You know, that's part of the reality. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I think it was worth actually taking the time to highlight and, and go over that because I don't think it's actually clear um, the extent of the challenges faced by, by many to some of our, our groups in the North. Um, I have a question. Uh, coming in via the <laughs> untraditional uh, means of communication that is Skype. Um, let me just pull it up for one second. So the question is, um, for those of us working, trying to mobilize for climate justice in, in countries in the South, um, often we're stuck in a bind. Uh, because on an international level, it's clear that the responsibility uh, lies squarely at the feet of northern states. But this reality um, invoked by southern states often gives those southern governments a, a sort of quote-unquote blank check to pursue the dirtiest and costliest forms of extractivism um, and energy policy. So how do you negotiate both the need to hold northern and um, southern groups uh, or southern countries uh, to account without um, giving weight to the awful narrative that we all have equal responsibilities and that there's no sort of differentiation um, in between in between different countries who have different realities. Um, and that question comes in from from Daniel, who is operating with uh, This Changes Everything UK, but also several groups in Latin America. So if you could take that, that would be great. Um. How do you do it? I mean, you just simply do it when I mean, when you're in the UNFCCC space. You can you shouldn't shut up about what southern governments' responsibilities are. You should talk about that. You should you should first of all be consistent with 
we have to be consistent with what we're doing in our own countries, which is challenging our governments to change policies, to change the system. In fact, not just challenging governments. Many of us are in the work of bringing down government so we can change government. No, um, And it doesn't mean that in, in an international space you stop talking about that. But you, we need to talk about that also because the most legitimate voice to talk about southern governments and criticize so southern governments are southern movements. No, uh, But we also should be careful that we don't fall into the trap of our voices and our positions being used by northern governments in order to you know, shift the blame. And that means we also should be not just focusing on our own governments in an international space, we should be just as clear, in fact, even more clear and even more strong about talking about the responsibilities and obligations of nor northern governments. And it's for for us, it it's not been that it's it's a it's an important. There's a you know it's a delicate balance that we need to keep, but. Um, it's not so difficult in the sense that we are also able to and should talk about the links, no? Because in in many cases, even though there are real contradictions between governments and international negotiations, because let's face it, they also have different interests on certain things, on a number of things. But in reality, there's a lot of linkages because southern governments are also collaborators with northern governments for many of the global policies that are being uh, implemented everywhere, including in our own country. So we need to, to talk about that uh, clearly and hold all governments to account. You know? uh, it helps when you have a framework in order to explain a framework that you use to explain what these different responsibilities are. They are different, but they're also related. To talk about it, why why it is so in a historical way, but also why uh, that doesn't exempt or that doesn't give a blank check to sovereign governments. Um, what I have a problem about is if uh, there is no clear analysis and clear evidences of what these responsibilities are and how these responsibilities may be different, but still responsibilities across the board, um, and just you know engage in, and this is what a number of the northern governments also do, engage in a lot of blame shifting. You know, um, there no, no one is not a single one of them are blameless. Uh, and they have all responsibilities towards us. We just need to be very clear about what those differences are, but to say that they all have responsibilities. Um, I'm seeing sorry, sorry, I was on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I lost my the sound. No, no. Okay. Um, yeah, I think we're I think we're coming up to the end, and I'm not seeing any questions coming in. I'm not able to see um, any. So, oh, there's one. Uh, so maybe just quick uh, squeeze one more in. Um, so it's coming from. Avishek uh, in, in Kathmandu in Nepal um, and he is asking uh, that uh, Nepali youth appeals to its government to offer a space um, for future climate refugees or climate displaced people from for example the Maldives um, and he's saying that uh, so the so-called LDCs are offering um, resources directly without the sort of dollar transaction um, and he's saying that that uh, can break the the hegemony of the US dollar um, and I think there's the rest of the question is not typed in but it's a sort of interesting I think reflection on 
how there is a lot of South-South solidarity in the absence of um, any kind of uh, true North-South solidarity at, at the governmental level. Um, and let me see, I think he's gotten the rest of the question. I think it's more like a sharing and not really a question, is it? Yeah, it's more it's more of a reflection. Um, possibly that's a nice way to to just sort of end. Uh, as I said, we were approaching the the end of our a lot of time. Um, I don't want to keep you. It's already nighttime in in Asia. Um, so I just oh, want to say well, again. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we all. I think we're all working late nights these days. But I just want to say again, thank you so much, Liddy, for for joining us. Um, maybe you just want to mention that you you're doing some mobilizations on the 29th because even though you know the Paris marches are are prohibited by the police, it's not like the rest of the world isn't mobilizing. So maybe just before you sign off, you could say something about that. Yeah, we're actually doing a week of actions in the Philippines uh, that starts on the, actually technically it starts on the 23rd, but the big mobilizations in different places start on the 25th. Uh, the biggest mobilization will be happening in Metro Manila on the 28th. Uh, so it's from the 25th to the 30th, there's different actions in at least 12 cities across the country in different islands. And Quezon City, where the biggest march will be taking place, it's actually six marches that's going to converge in an elliptical road. So each march will have a theme, one on food, land, and water, one on energy, one on uh, emissions by the rich industrialized countries, one on the uh, reparations for affected people, one on jobs and just transition, and so on and so forth. So it's we're all going to converge uh, the six marches in an elliptical road where there's a lot of national government offices, and we're going to march around. And we hope to be from 25 to 30,000 people. So that's wow. on the 28th, and yeah, we will join the world for all these mobilizations. That sounds amazing, um, and I think some. I think that's a good lift for people who are feeling sort of depressed uh, that the Paris March was called off. It's really good to hear that other parts of the world are really, really holding down. Um, you will be coming to Paris after that, after organizing and taking part in those mobilizations. So people who are watching, you will get a chance if you're also coming to Paris to see Lydia about and perhaps meet her um, in the uh, in the COP. Um, I also want to remind people that our next um, webinar, the next and last in the series, is going to be on Monday, so we'll take a little break for the weekend. Um, it will be Monday the 23rd of November at 4 p.m. GMT, uh, and that will be taking, uh, taking place again on Google Hangouts and streamed live to YouTube. That'll be with Asad Rehman from Friends of the Earth in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit more in a similar uh, vein to Liddy about the role of civil society in the negotiations. Um, but he's obviously talking about it from a, a slightly different perspective uh, in that he's coming from uh, communities and community organizing in the global north. So it's nice to get a, a bit of a uh, not necessarily contrast, but just slight, uh, slight difference there. Um, so don't miss that. Definitely, definitely join us again for that. Um, and yeah, thank you once again to the Earth and Brackets group for organizing this and making it happen. And obviously, a huge thanks goes out again to to Lily Nakpil from the Asian People's Movement on Debt and Development for joining us today. Thanks again, Lily. Thank you. Thank you for having me. See you in Paris. See you in Paris. Bye.